It's like that coming out thing here. When am I going to tell them again? I'm not someone who's ever wanted to have children. But kids are forever kids in my eyes. I take a pill every single day, which means it's impossible to catch HIV from On me. On my Grinder profile, I was openly out, mm. and I would get taunts, I would get discrimination, I would get stigma leveled my you way. You you. Therefore, not a problem. I was more surprised when it became a bit of a thing. Hey. Hey. Uh, my name's Bo, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm living with HIV. My name's Emily, my pronouns are she or they, and I'm a friend of Bo's. <laughs> How long have you been living with HIV? Oh, I'm always really bad at remembering this. I blame COVID ruining my perception of time, but I think it is from New Year's 2019. Yeah. Yeah, you're always much better than, at dates than- I am good at I am. <laughs> how did you initially react when I shared my HIV status with you and how did it make you feel? <laughs> I think I reacted pretty well. But in my head, I was like, damn it, you've ruined all my plans. <laughs> because at that very coffee that we were having when you told me, I was about to ask you to be my sperm donor. Mm. And so even though I wasn't particularly worried about, like, the, you know, getting HIV through sperm donation, because it's pretty impossible, um, I was worried about your general mental health and how you were taking it. I was like, mm, this is probably not the best time to bring that up then. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I essentially told you as soon as I found out, but it was a bit complicated for, for me just because I was Came back at like indeterminate something. Yeah, I was getting tested right on the window period. So one of my HIV tests came back positive and the other ones came back negative, so. They were like, oh, we have to wait for the fancy, the fancy machine. Um, yeah, but yeah, essentially you found out and yeah. not too long after I found out. Um, okay, so did you take any steps to learn more about HIV after I shared my status with you? No. <laughs> you didn't look up like HIV sperm donation? <laughs> no, well, I, I didn't assume it would be a problem. I was like, it's, well, it was 2020 by that stage, but... Um, yeah. And you equals you, therefore not a problem. I was more surprised when it became a bit of a thing. Mm, yeah, That's good point. Right. It's like people are already doing this manually, so yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> don't know and why. It's undetectable. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was impressed by how quickly you were undetectable. I mm. didn't know science could be that good. Um, do you think our relationship has changed since I told you about my HIV status? If so, how? Probably has, but it's not really anything to do with your status. I mm. think, you know, relationships just kind of grow and evolve over time. I don't think it's changed significantly. I think EJ is a bigger yeah. <laughs> change than HIV. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, like, if anything, I think the main impact is that it, it's essentially kind of made me stay in Australia because mm. I was living overseas a lot as an HIV positive person it's so so much harder to to live in a, a country that isn't your own <laughs> what would you say to someone who is thinking of disclosing their HIV status to their friend make sure they have good friends I think yeah. <laughs> um, but also you know if your friend reacts badly then you probably need to reconsider mm. you know, I guess, you know, A, if they're our, a good friend, but um, I, there's so, not everybody has the, like, you know, experience that I have, so necessarily knows mm. all that much about it. But it is also 2023, so maybe they should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, so, yeah. I don't know. I think just consider who they're telling and, like, you know, what their background is and what, you know, if they know of any sort of prejudice as well. Mm. So I guess like, you know, think about why you're telling them and what sort of reaction and if they're the right person. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's the same advice I give a lot of people that you really kind of need to ask yourself, why are you telling this person and what do you want out of it? Yeah. 
because yeah if you're doing it to get support you kind of really have to choose people that you like know have the the capacity to be able to give yeah, that to you. Yeah, it's not only that initial reaction, but... Yeah. Uh, like, I always yeah. avoid what I call the Hollywood moment, which is the sit down, I need to tell you something, <laughs> because I feel like that adds this, yeah. like, level of melodrama to it. I would have um, been like, oh, my God, something terrible, and then you'd say that and I'd be like, <laughs> that was it? I thought you were about to die. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but, I don't know, the more people I've told, I think the more you realise how much like negative information gets through to people and positive information you equals you the 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 new treatments all of that like yeah. a I lot think, of that stuff doesn't get through i reckon if i had just like gone to uni and then gone into like corporate world far away from any sort of hiv sector or lgbti bubble i might not have known learned anything past you know those posters in the queer space mm. Um, mm. Why do you believe it's important for you to have control over who you share with your HIV status or who you share your HIV status with and that no one discloses it without your consent? Yeah, I think it's really easy to underestimate how stigma is like really embedded in people's perceptions of HIV. Uh, like I don't think there's any other um, medical condition or very few where people a get really focused focus on the how yeah. like they really want to kind of it's like are you a good person that got <laughs> HIV or a bad person that got HIV which is just such a strange mindset to bring to a health condition um, and then I think it's like just a lot of people because there is so much fear um, in people about HIV it like makes them very anxious and for a lot of people their way of dealing with that anxiety is to avoid people with HIV which you know in the modern context makes no sense like toddlers are more contagious yeah so I think it's really hard to be able to kind of preempt how people are going to react and so if you're you know accidentally telling um, you know, disclosing someone's status to, you know, groups of people, mm. it, you can really do some really unintentional harm to them. You know, sometimes things still surprise me. Like if I, like Grindr for instance, you can put your status on it, on your Grindr profile or you can um, kind of not answer. And I get way more messages if I don't answer than the one thing, the, the place that surprised me the most is I was, when I was visiting New York, um, and in my head, you know, like the the city of ACT UP, blah, blah, blah. This one, like, must be so normalized here. And then I wasn't getting any messages on Grindr in New York. And I was like, this is weird. I'm like a new face. You know, yeah. normally on your holiday, you get lots of messages. And then I was like, oh, my status is still up because I'd just been to a, the AIDS conference. Yeah. Um, so I took that off and immediately started getting messages and I was like, wow, I can't believe New York is <laughs> like still in this state of mind. But I, I also think that's why it's so important to speak up because it's, pe unless people start realising that things have changed then it's always going to be that background level of fear. Yeah. So yeah, we mentioned already earlier that like I was going to ask you to be a sperm donor but it was not a great day that day to do so um and mentioned EJ already so then what was it a year almost exactly a year it was about the same and pretty much fairly close spot mm. I think um then I asked you to be a sperm donor because by that stage you were definitely undetectable and you kind of settled in mm. um it was weird though, because even though, like, I thought, you know, you're a good, good human, good genetics, you're always much healthier than me, which was a selling point. <laughs> um, but I was still very surprised when, like, EJ ended up being essentially a mini version of you. I was not know what I was <laughs> expecting, but I was very surprised. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we had that conversation probably about January 2020. Yeah, and I, I was 
Like I wasn't hesitant in terms of sperm donation, but I think I'd already knew that HIV was still in a bit of a gray area when it came yeah, to- Yeah, you were a bit more skeptical. Donation. I, and I think this is because I had already heard of um, positive people who had tried it and been pushed back on. So then we started in March, well, I started the whole process in March. Um, we had to have like counseling and then all sorts of appointments and stuff. But then we didn't hear anything. There was like, from in the middle of the year, we just stopped hearing from the clinic entirely. Mm. And I kept chasing them and chasing them and they were giving me absolutely nothing. They kept saying, we'll let Bo know when it's time for him to donate. And then Bo heard nothing and I heard nothing. And eventually I had to put in a complaint um, and we found out that their policies had said that they didn't accept HIV positive donation mm. of any type. Um, and they had looked at their policies and they were like, oh, this is outdated. Yeah. So in the background, they were updating all of their policies, yeah. um, but not telling us why there was just this big wait. Yeah. And realistically, it took them about three months. Um, and having changed policies at work, yeah. that's yeah. very fast. They yeah, yeah. Well. They were working yeah, very hard behind the scenes to make that happen. Yeah. But yeah, I think it, we were A, very lucky that um, the person that it was helping us out um, kind of took that upon themselves that we didn't really have to kind yeah. of be the instigators of that. And it worked first go and we got EJ who is now two. Mm. And delightful most of the time. <laughs> Unless he has not eaten. Yes, um, so he's less delightful. Okay, so... Uh, but then, so I went back to the clinic, and then a few failed rounds and a couple of miscarriages later, now there's two. Mm. Well, two on the way. Yeah, well, somewhere in there. <laughs> Some of it's just fine. <laughs> so, how will we bring HIV into the conversation with EJ? Like, he's got a little baby book, um, which includes his kind of how I came to be story, and it's in that. Okay. So, yeah. um, it's gonna be like pretty much something that he's gonna have known since he was little. And it's just like, it's always been that way. It's not gonna be introduced specifically. Because, mm. um, you know, we go through the book, look at the pictures of when he was born, when he can read the story himself, he'll be able to read it to himself. Otherwise, yeah, nice. I mean, I tell we tell people this story all the time. Yeah. It's quite a good achievement, I reckon. <laughs> um, what was the biggest misconception about the process? Um, oh, misconception. I think, yeah, just the idea that um, we were doing something potentially risky. Um, and then I think also for me that... Um, that a urine urine sample cup is the best thing to put a sperm donation into. Because <laughs> that is not very practical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and that um, Himalayan rock salt lamps will make a doctor's office, like, sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah! Well done. We ended HIV! Yeah. <laughs>